Good morning, Chandler. Good morning. Today is such a beautiful day, and I'm glad I can share it with all of you as we come into God's house to worship Him. A few announcements before we begin. Uh, the notes regarding a ride for Lyndon Stevens, she does not need a ride for September, that has been fulfilled, but please keep her in your prayers as she goes through cancer treatments, and if you think you can drive in October, please give Patsy a call, and well, we'll keep you informed. There's still time to get your birthday card into Nell. I know I have my card. I haven't given it to her yet, but I look forward to being able to go to Ed Brooke and give it to her herself. So you still have time to write Nell a happy birthday card as she turns 100. After our worship service today, we'll have our congregational meeting. Uh, there'll be a short five minute break afterwards to allow everyone to take care of whatever business they need, stretch your legs, uh, get a little quick refreshment, but we'll start five minutes after the worship service. Just a kind of a quick idea of what will happen. We will open, establish quorum, pray, I will give the rules. Everyone is allowed a chance to speak their, to speak their mind. We do ask that to keep it with under two minutes. Once everyone has spoken their piece, we will vote on the minute. And with that, brothers and sisters, let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God. Will you please join me in prayer? O holy God, from whom all good blessings come, I thank you for this day that you have made. I thank you for opening up your house to us, for giving us your Son and your Spirit, for nourishing us in all that we need. So Lord, we pray that your will be done today as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our psalm reading today is Psalm 121. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Brothers and sisters, we please rise and worship our Lord as we sing together number 730, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus.
be with you all. As God has welcomed you here today, please turn to your neighbor and welcome them. teaching on prayer. We please join me for reciting Lord's Day 48. What does the second petition mean? Your kingdom come means rule us by your word and spirit in such a way that more and more we submit to you. Preserve your church and make it grow. Destroy the devil's work. Destroy every force which revolts against you and every conspiracy against your holy word. Do this until your kingdom fully comes, when you will be all in all. Brothers and sisters, we pray that God's kingdom will come. And when God's kingdom come, it will come with glory and forgiveness. So let us experience God's kingdom today as we go to God, confess our sins, and receive his pardon. Will you please join me in prayer? Holy God, our Lord and Savior, we come to you with the penitence of the prodigal son, confessing that we have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Blessed be your name. You give freely the bread of life to all who seek your fullness, and you bestow the Father's blessing on every returning wanderer. And we have wandered from you, our God, we have used our goods you have given us, as though they belong to us, forgetting that our life and breath and all things are from you. Often we have lived as if we had no Heavenly Father to thank for, our, for his goodness. We joined ourselves to the alien of a far country, but no one gave to us what would feed and nourish us. We sought food for our wants and earthly pleasures, but they were only as husks to our souls. And now we come back crying, why should we perish with hunger, when there is bread enough in our Father's house to spare? O oh God, be merciful to sinners, 
Grant us forgiveness. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in this life, in his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus assures us that we are no longer in sin. Indeed, there is no sin so terrible that God cannot forgive us. There is no hurt so terrible that God cannot heal us. God accepts us, forgives us, and God sets us free. Receive the forgiving love of God. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. It's a hymn of thanks and praise. We join me in singing 637 Instruments of Your Peace. Our scripture reading today is Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. But first, let us pray the Spirit will illumine our reading. Holy Father, Holy Son, and Holy Ghost, I thank you for giving us your word that teaches us about God's love, what Jesus has done for us. So we pray, Holy Spirit, that you fill us with the light of Christ, fill us with wisdom and knowledge, and the strength to do God's will. In his name we pray, amen. Esther, chapter 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province into which the edict or order of the king came, 
there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hapit, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hapit went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her, and he told him to urge her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hapik went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned by the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. This is the word of the Lord. Who doesn't like fun and excitement? I know as a kid, that's all I wanted to do, and I'm pretty sure my daughter is the same way. Even as an adult, I like fun and exciting things. And yet, my time in the Navy taught me to appreciate boring and dull days. Those are good days. The days when nothing worth recording in the log happened. Why are these good days? Because that means nothing broke, nobody got hurt, and I could go home on time. That is a good Navy day. I'm sure as we all get older, we come to appreciate those boring, dull, and consistent days. As farmers, we like the years when the crop gets planted on time, when there's just enough rain and sun to make it grow, and nothing bad happens during harvest. We like it when all the employees show up for time in the morning, when none of the machinery breaks and we meet our daily quota. Those are good days. And yet, those good days aren't worth remembering. We're much more likely to remember the days when the flange on the loop oil pump breaks and the hundred gallons of oil get sprayed all over everything. We're much more likely to remember the droughts and the floods and the early frosts. We're much more likely to remember the bad days. Now, I'm sure a psychologist could give a long and technical explanation for why we do that. But I think we remember the bad days because it is then when we most clearly experience God's presence. It is during the times when we don't know what to do when we don't know what's going on, when we don't know where our help will come from, it is those days that force us to rely upon God's faithfulness. And when we look back on those days, we can clearly see God's hand carrying us through. But to better understand that, let us take another look at Esther chapter 4. We pick up our story with Mordecai putting on ash cloth, covering himself in sackcloth and ashes in mourning. 
Indeed, all the Jews who are who come to find out the king's edict begin mourning right away. Everyone, that is, except for Esther. Apparently, she has no idea what's going on out in the world. And yet, all the other Jews are mourning. They're crying out, they're fasting, and they're weeping. But there is something special about this. You see, Esther, again, is famous for not explicitly referencing God. We hear about the Jews fasting and weeping and wailing, but we don't hear about them wailing to God. They're not praying to God. For me, this reminds me of the beginning of Exodus, when the people of Israel are experiencing the hardship of slavery and the persecution of the Pharaoh, and they cry out in their anguish. But they don't cry out to anybody. They don't know who to cry out to. They don't know where their help will come from. In Exodus, their cries go up to heaven, and God hears their complaints, and he does something about that. Fast forward many centuries, the people of Israel are in exile. The Jews have been scattered throughout the Persian Empire. Once again, they are facing annihilation. Once again, they weep and wail and they cry out. Who do they cry out to? Well, the text doesn't tell us. And we're left to conclude they cry out to no one. They don't know who to cry out. They don't know where the help comes from. This might be a surprise. After all, the Jews now have the Law of Moses. They have the histories. They should know about God and how to cry out to them. But here's the thing. They no longer have a king. They no longer have God's temple. They no longer even have the tabernacle. At least in the Exodus, they had Moses and his staff, but as exiles in the Persian Empire, they have nothing. No prophet, no leader, no tabernacle, no temple. What can they do? How can they go to God? All the instructions they received in the law can't be done. It appears hopeless. They have no way of approaching God. And so they fast, they cry, they weep. They don't know what to do. They don't know where their help will come from. Well, that is, except for Mordecai. Mordecai also puts on sackcloth and ashes, and he goes about mourning in the city. One thing I come to appreciate about Mordecai is that he's a man who knows things, and everything he does, he does out in the open. Remember, Mordecai is the one who uncovered the plot to kill the king, and he reported it right away. And everything was done out in the open, even recorded in the king's histories. Mordecai is wailing and weeping out in the open square. Everyone sees what's happening to Mordecai. And eventually that news reaches Esther. Esther, surprisingly, has no clue what's going on. Apparently, nobody bothered to tell the queen and everyone in her palace what is happening throughout the rest of the empire. But she hears about Mordecai's trouble. And her great love for Mordecai compels her to try to comfort him, to send him new clothes, to give him comfort in his time of anguish. But Mordecai doesn't need new clothes. Mordecai's anguish isn't just for him personally, but for all the people. Mordecai needs much more than just sympathy from one person. And so we have a discussion with Hapit as an intermediary back and forth between Mordecai and Esther. Again, everything is being done out in the open. Mordecai isn't scheming behind anyone's back. In fact, Mordecai has had an open relationship with his adopted daughter for many years. Remember back in chapter 2 we read about him, how Mordecai would go to visit her every day. This was part of his normal practice. And just keep that point in mind, it's going to be important later on. Mordecai's normal practice to go and check up on Esther, but that pattern has broken right now because he's outside the city 
weeping. Half it goes and brings him comfort, but Mordecai refuses that comfort because Mordecai needs something better than just clothes. So Esther again sends half the gout to him, this time asking what is causing this trouble. It is then that Mordecai tells Hathak and through Hathak Esther the full story about Haman and the edict and the money and the destruction that is coming upon all the Jews. Now, in our translation, Mordecai urges Esther to go and speak to the king. Other translations here have a bit more of a colorful expression. It actually translates him as commanding Esther to go to the king on behalf of the Jews. This surprises me because, well, one, most people don't command queens what to do. Only the king can do that. And yet, Mordecai is also the adopted father of Esther. There's a relationship there. But Esther does not obey that command. Instead, she argues back with the law, and she is right to do that. She can't just go to the king whenever she feels like it. There's a proper place and time and procedure to follow. Remember, if we use the king as a metaphor for how to approach God, we see the problem of the Jews on full display right there. There's a procedure they have to follow in order to go before God and make their prayers heard. That can't happen whenever you feel like it. And that's a story we read about over and over again in the Old Testament. People brazenly approaching God who seek to grab hold of God's ark, or authority in God's house, and they receive the punishment for that. But we also see people who humbly approach God, not in accordance with the law, but in accordance with the spirit God has given them, humbly approach God with their request. And those people are heard by God. This is a lesson we're seeing play out again Esther reminds Mordecai that the law clearly states, I can't go whenever I feel like it. And Mordecai responds with wisdom. Help from the, for the Jews is going to come from somewhere. Now Mordecai does not specifically say God, but we clearly see his faith on display. Help is going to come. Help is going to come. What great faith is that? And when we face our own dark times, our own troubles, can we look that dark day in the face and say, help is going to come, and act with confidence based upon that hope? Can we be like Mordecai and not just tell ourselves that help is going to come, but encourage one another with that truth? Mordecai encourages Esther with those words. He also chastises her a little bit, warning her that you aren't going to escape—excuse me—you won't escape this coming judgment. Again, as a metaphor for God's judgment, God, the day of the Lord will come from everyone. We can't think that our position in this world is going to keep us safe from God's judgment. Not as a pastor, not as a lifelong member of a church, or as a new convert. Our good deeds are worth nothing when God's judgment comes. So don't cling to our positions or families or anything that we have. Rather, cling to God's hope. Esther hears this encouragement and a little bit of chastisement, and she responds in a most miraculous way. Esther grows in faith and maturity. It is now Esther's time to give Mordecai a command. She agrees to follow this request. And she gives Mordecai the command, and not just Mordecai, but all the Jews in Susa, fast for me. I and my attendants will also fast for the next three days. But you must fast also. 
You see here Esther growing in her maturity and her authority and maturity. She reminds Mordecai that it's not just Esther who's in this. It's not just Esther who's going to flee. But all the people, even though they're not there physically, are there spiritually making this plea as well. That is good news and encouragement. At least it is for me, and I hope it is for you. For when we face troubling times, we do not face them alone. And there is plenty of trouble in this world. We don't know what's going to happen with our nation, or even with our country. We had classes meeting this week, and we drove across Minnesota, and we saw many fields that weren't ripening the way they should. There was much brown out there, many beans that were turning yellow, and ironically, there were many fields that had received too much rain. They weren't mature enough at this point in time. And it makes us all wonder, what's going to happen with this harvest? Where's our help going to come from? Now, of course, we know that God is in control and that God is always with us. But again, remember, it's easy to forget that in good times. It is in these troubling times when that forces us to ask the question, where is our help going to come from? And it forces us to live into our answer. Our help comes from the Lord. Today's, or this week's class meeting was a rough one. I won't go into many of the details, but as we know, many churches are leaving the denomination right now. We had five of them leave this week. I would like to say it was a graceful separation, but emotions ran high. There were a lot of arguments. And at the end, after those churches who departed, departed, those who remained sat there, kind of stunned silence. We didn't know what to do. This is why, and this is why I love the Reformed Church, because the most pastoral thing said that day did not come from a pastor, but from an elder. This elder shared a story from his life, a tragedy that happened in his youth. He shared his life experiences with us, and he reminded us that we are not promised anything good in this world. Let me pause there for a moment. We're not promised easy times. We're not promised wealth. We're not promised comfort. What we are promised is God's presence in the difficult times. And so we shouldn't ask, why do bad things happen to me? He reminded us that we should ask, why not me? And there is no, and the answer to that question is, well, <laughs> we are again, we're not promised comfort. Why not me? There is no correct answer to that, because we're all human. We all suffer. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to this world to suffer for us, to take up his cross on our behalf, and he commands us to follow him to take up our own crosses, to endure the hardships of this world, to faithfully follow God's law, and to give a good testimony. We are called to trust to God's providence. Jesus did that with his life, death, and resurrection. Mordecai did that when he put on ashes and sackcloth and petitioned Esther on the path of the Jews. And we see that again happening with Esther as she prepares to embark on a very dangerous plan. But unlike the Jews in Persia, we know where our help comes from. We, like them, live in ministry. But unlike them, we know where God's grace comes from. We have been given Jesus. So brothers and sisters, let us all be like Mordecai and Esther. But since we have Jesus, let us Surpass them in faithfulness and hope and trust. Let us surpass them in doing good works for one another. Not in order to earn our salvation, but because we have been saved. Because we have received 
grace from Christ. Indeed, we see grace on top of grace from Christ. So let us not be weighed down by the worries of this world. Let us mourn when it's time to mourn, but let us rejoice in that time of mourning. For Christ has overcome this world, and his name will be glorified today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Let us pray. Holy God, I thank you for being our Lord and King, for being our Savior and our Redeemer. I thank you, Jesus, for all that you did on our behalf. And I pray that we will boldly proclaim your name and seek to do your will. May we be like Mordecai and Esther. May we be full of boldness and faith. May we not give in to the trouble of this world, but, we may, but may we let your light shine all the brighter. In your name we pray. Amen. We have special music today for our song of response. Uh, special music is for such a time as this. It's a special music video.
this time I invite our deacons to come forward and lead us in the giving of our gifts. Year, they fell roughly 330 gifts short here in Murray County. So please join me in prayer now. Heavenly Father, thank you for watching over us last night and for waking us up this morning to a beautiful new day. We are indeed blessed to come to your house to praise and worship you. No matter how much drama is in our lives or how much pain in our bodies, we know that, Lord, you are watching over us. Thank you for caring for us through the past week and for all you will do for us in the days ahead. Be with those this day who stand in need in any challenge they may be facing. Allow them to feel your presence that they may find comfort and strength. And now, as we receive these offerings, may they be a blessing to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. physical gifts to God, let us also bring our prayers. Holy God, I thank you for this day that you have made. I thank you for your people, for your word, and your son. I thank you that your spirit fills us all with your presence and glory and power. Lord, I thank you for a day of rest when we can stop our work and enjoy your grace. And Lord, I pray that the grace that we receive today will overflow and fill the world outside. As we walk in this world, Lord, may your light continue to shine through us, spreading your kingdom wherever we go. And so, Lord, we continue to pray for our world. We pray for our church and our town, our nation, and all the people of this planet. For we are all your creation. And we all rest in your hands. Lord, we continue to pray for peace in Ukraine, Pray for all the nations of the world that are experiencing violence and turmoil. 
Lord, we pray for our nation as we undergo another election year. Pray that citizens, Lord, will not turn into enemies, but that we may have fruitful discussions, that we will work together for the good of our neighbor. And Lord, we pray for our politicians and our government officials who do the work of the land. May they act wisely and justly. We pray for those men and women in the military and who work in law enforcement. Lord, may they be instruments of peace and not of war. May their work, Lord, be blessed. May they be a defense between violence. May they protect the innocent. We also thank you, Lord, for our first responders, for the firefighters and people, EMTs, and all who put their lives on the line to protect others. Keep them safe, O Lord, and bless their work. We thank you, Lord, for our schools, for our teachers and staff, who do such hard work to raise our kids, teaching them how to read and write and all that they need to know to become adults. But Lord, without you, our work is nothing. So I pray your spirit will fill our schools with your presence. Will you fill our children with your spirit, so that they may grow straight and true, overflowing with faith, hope, and love. And Lord, we thank you for our missionaries who go out in the world, Hebrews and the Brunsworths and the Ward Silvas. We pray that their work, Lord, will be a blessing to your name and a blessing to the people they live with. And may we also do that work in our own lives, here in Chandler and throughout Minnesota. May we also be a blessing to our neighbors. And Lord, we ask that your kingdom come as it is in heaven. We ask that Jesus, that you come down and that you establish your reign completely and fully. But until that day comes, may we walk faithfully and boldly, teaching our children and teaching the world about your name. For your name is lovely and our only joy and comfort in this life. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us rise and sing our doxology. by the power of God, by the work of Jesus Christ in the presence of this Holy Spirit, God, working through his people, actually attacks the darkness. Bad times don't happen to us, we happen to the bad times, for God has placed us here for such a time as this. So let the Holy Spirit fill you with power, and may you be the light that pushes back the dark this week. Let us conclude our time of worship by singing number 733, Once to Every Man and Nation, verses 1, 2, and 3.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn to you and give you peace.